Yeah. Okay, folks, uh, we can get started. The AV in here seems to be acting up a little bit today, so hopefully this stays stable, um, but we'll see. So there were just a handful of logistical things I wanted to go through before getting into the content. Um, first is I'm going to be making the first round of purchases at the end of the workday today. So if you haven't already, oops, uh, stop, cancel. If you haven't already on the course webpage, there's a link here through which you can make requests for any items that you might need for your final projects. Um, whatever is submitted by the end of the workday today, I'll submit a purchase request for, and I expect that those things will start arriving end of this week, early next week. Uh, I am going to do a second round of purchases in the event that folks forget to order something, um, but please try to get all of your purchase requests submitted by the end of the workday today. Yeah. You prefer the link to be like Amazon or like a parts website? I, I don't have a strong preference. Um, if whatever it is that you're trying to purchase is available on like DigiKey, the, it's really easy for us to purchase things from that kind of vendor. But, but wherever it's available is fine. Yeah. Can we assume that like if we want to use like the H bridges from another lab that those would be available or should we submit a purchase request? You could assume that and any materials that we used in previous labs, you, you can assume that they're available in the lab for you to use. And those materials will not count towards your $25 that uh, you are allowed to have me spend, but they will count towards the $125 total that you are allowed to spend on the project. Okay. Any other questions about purchasing things? Yeah. Uh, it does not except for in extreme circumstances. Yeah. Anything else? Is anyone purchasing cameras? I know you all are. Anybody else? Okay. I thought there were a few other groups that were thinking about it. Um, if you are thinking about purchasing a camera, there are a handful of cameras that are compatible with the Pico. What I would recommend you do is, first of all, do a search to figure out all of the cameras that could potentially operate in conjunction with the Pico. And that's going to give you, you know, some list. And then go through each camera in that list and read its data sheet, paying particular attention to the interface through which you communicate with that camera. There are some cameras where the interface is relatively standard, something like an SPI channel. And then there are other cameras for which the interface is um, I have seen cameras where the interface looks something like you provide the camera a high speed clock signal and it puts pixel information back in parallel over like eight GPIO ports. That has the advantage of being able to communicate pixel information more quickly, but the interface is just a little bit more complicated. So depending on what exactly you're trying to do with the camera, one or the other might make sense for you. Um, and the other thing I'd encourage you to just pay attention with with regard to cameras is the amount of configuration that might be required for that particular model. There are some that require a tremendous amount of configuration to get an image out. And there are others that you sort of plug it in and an image comes out. So again, depending on what you're trying to do, one or another might be better or worse for your particular application. Okay. Any other questions? So my tentative plan, incidentally, is, as I've mentioned a couple of times, at some point each semester, we transition from lecture to just additional time in lab to work together on final projects. I think that'll happen starting next week, so starting on Monday. Um, and what that'll mean is that instead of coming here to lecture, we'll go to the lab. The one caveat being, I believe that on Mondays, 2300 is in there during our scheduled lecture time. So I will schedule additional hours on Mondays that are as long as the lecture time, but that don't overlap, overlap with another class. But on all the other lecture times, I'll just be there in the lab. Um, and I'll clarify too, because I've had a couple of questions. As we transition into the final projects, you're, you're still expected to come to all of your scheduled lab sections. So if you're in the Wednesday afternoon sections, I'll see all the Wednesday afternoon people in the Wednesday afternoon section for sure. But then there will be a bunch of other times where you can come and work on your projects. And again, the expectation is uh, a four credit class. So the expectation is that you're working on these projects for something like 16-ish hours a week or so. That's about the scope that we're looking for. <laughs>
Okay. Any final project questions? Okay. Let me know if anything comes to mind. Um, otherwise, what I plan on talking about today is continuing in this, this sort of vein of introducing uh, topics that may be of general relevance for folks for their final projects. What I want to talk about today is the power saving opportunities on the RP2040, how you can handle, how you can do power management on the RP2040. Why would you care about such things? Well, if your project is some sort of an IoT flavored thing where perhaps you care about battery longevity, you will care about this, right? You, this, so what I want to talk through it at a relatively high level is how you might drop the average power consumption over the course of a period of time. In order to have that discussion, we actually have to talk about the, the power saving mechanism on the RP2040 is sort of inescapably coupled with a couple of other subsystems on here. So I want to talk about the clocks subsystem on here because a lot of what the power saving uh, control and configuration registers do is manipulate the various clocks that are on the RP2040 so that we can essentially turn off stuff that we're not using. And I also want to talk about the real time clock peripheral that's available on here because that also sort of couples with the power savings. So let me start by pulling up the data sheet. And I want to go first to, I want to talk first about the clocks on here. So let's see, let's go to the clock subsection. And I have some notes on my phone, so I'm not like reading text, I'm reading my notes. So um, I, we'll start with just sort of a high level overview of how this works. The way that the clocks are organized here is there are a handful of what the data sheet calls clock sources. So these are systems that are generating a clock signal. And there are a handful of these available on the RP2040. In particular, there is um, the opportunity to to interface an external crystal, crystal oscillator with the RP2040. So this will be something that's in the range of, it says in here, but I believe the one that we're using on the Pico, the one that's on the Pico is 12 megahertz. But it's, it's an external device that generates a rather precise clock that we feed into the RP2040. So this is one example of a clock source. There are other examples of clock sources. There is also available for you to use if you care to a ring oscillator. Some of you have been experimenting with this already. Um, the ring oscillator is different from the crystal oscillator in a few ways. One is it requires no external components whatsoever. It's entirely internal to the RP2040. Um, so if you were doing some sort of industrial application where you cared very deeply about maybe the cost of the project, you can't afford, you know, in massive scale to get a ton of these, or perhaps you care about the number of external components that are on a printed circuit board or something like that. The ring oscillator has the advantage of requiring no external components whatsoever. It has the disadvantage, however, of not being of a fixed frequency. So we can guarantee the frequency of the clock coming out of the external crystal oscillator to within, you know, a very small number of parts per million, actually. It's a very, very precise clock. This, however, the ring oscillator, it will generate a clock signal that varies as a function of the processes that are running on the chip, the voltage that's being applied to the chip, and the temperature. So you could imagine that if you were trying to do something that required incredibly precise timing, uh, this is probably not the right choice for you, right? But if you don't care that much about timing, maybe you aren't trying to do some sort of you know, uh, high speed digital interface. Maybe, maybe you're not trying to do like USB communication where you would care deeply about timing. You're trying to just do something that's a little bit more low fidelity in a timing sense, then maybe the ring oscillator is a nice choice for you. This external crystal oscillator incidentally also feeds a couple of phase lock loops. The system PLL, which will take as an input the, the clock signal coming out of this crystal oscillator, which as I mentioned, it'll be oh, a few tens of megahertz. I believe we're using 12 megahertz. And then the PLL increases the frequency of that clock to, uh, well, by default, 125 megahertz. But as we discovered in lab two, you can play with this, right? So you could, you could we were running it at 250 megahertz. Um, and then there's a separate PLL that feeds the USB peripheral. You could alternatively, if you cared to, interface some sort of external clock or relaxation oscillator to 
one of a handful of the GPIO ports and clock the system off of that. So all of these are, are the ring oscillator, the crystal oscillator, the PLLs that are, are being fed by this crystal oscillator, and potentially this external clock that, come, that interfaces with a handful of these GPIOs. These are all the sources of clock. These are actually generating the clock signals. These all get fed into a handful of what the data sheet calls um, clock generators. And what these do is essentially take, there's a multiplexer on the input of, of most of these clock generators that allow for you to select from one of a number of the clock sources. And what they do is take that clock source in and modify it such that it generates a clock that's compatible with, with whichever peripheral or handful of peripherals that, that that particular clock is supplying. So for instance, um, there is a signal called clock underscore ADC, which clocks the ADC. Remember from lab two, the ADC actually runs at 48 megahertz. It doesn't run at 125 megahertz. It runs at a different, slightly slower rate. Um, the way that that 48 megahertz signal is being generated is we're specifying one of these clock sources as the in, uh, as being the one that we're selecting on this multiplexer into the, the ADC clock generator. That then goes through a clock divider. Remember that we had the opportunity when we were configuring the ADC to specify a slower rate that we would like for it to run. What we're doing there is modifying the divider in the clock generator that's connected to the ADC. And then, interestingly, for a power save, from a power saving perspective, there is an enable so you could turn off that clock generator if you chose to. We'll talk about why that's useful from a power saving perspective. What we're gonna discover when it comes to power saving on, on this microcontroller and on microcontrollers in general is, I mean, it, it's a whole lot like power saving in your own house or apartment. It fundamentally often boils down to turn off stuff that you're not using. And what this, this enable block is indicating is that if we are not using, say, the ADC, we could turn off the clock generator associated with the ADC and save ourselves the power dissipation associated with supplying that clock, right? So there's, it introduces some flexibility in that regard. Um, the other sort of interesting thing that I'll point out here available in this, this clock generator blocks on the, on the diagram is this frequency counter. So in addition to generating all of these clock signals, the clock subsystem on the RP2040 also allows for you to measure the frequency of one of the clocks being generated. It measures it incidentally relative to uh, the reference clock here, right? So you have to measure it relative to something. But what it does is you specify some period of time over which you would like to measure the frequency of one of these clock signals. It counts the rising edges. And then, you know, using the number of rising edges that it counted over that period of time, um, and the, and the, yeah, so from the number of edges that it counts over that period of time, it will compute the frequency of that clock and report it back to you. Which is really nice from a debugging perspective. So, because suppose you're going in and trying to modify, you know, one of these clock generators, or you're going in and trying to touch one of these PLLs, and you want to confirm that your modifications are actually doing something, you can measure the frequency of the clocks using this frequency counter. The other interesting thing that you might do is, Remember that I mentioned that the frequency of the ring oscillator is a function of the, the processes that are running on the chip, the voltage and the temperature. If you know two out of the three of those things and you measure the frequency of the, of the ring oscillator, you may sort of be able to estimate the third one. It'd be kind of interesting. You're sort of using the ring oscillator as a sensor in some sense, which could be kind of interesting to try. You could, if you cared to, clock the whole system off this ring oscillator. Um, and then you could imagine, you know, if you were willing to do things that would definitely void your warranty, you may be able to just overclock this thing automatically by modifying the voltage and temperature of the system in such a way that you maximize the frequency of this ring oscillator. Again, you're sacrificing, by using this, you're sacrificing consistency in the clock rate. It's going to vary. but you can generate clock rates that are quite high. If you clock it off the ring oscillator and you modify the voltage and the temperature such that you maximize the frequency that it's generating. I think I mentioned previously that there's an article that I could point you to where uh, someone at Raspberry Pi, I think it was an intern at Raspberry Pi, managed to run this thing at a gigahertz briefly. 
Do you have questions about this? I'm gonna briefly check my notes about this. Oh, and the other thing that I'll just briefly mention, the other kind of interesting thing that you can do is you can output up to four of these generated clock signals out through the GPIOs. So if you wanted to put a clock signal out through one of the GPIO ports for some reason, maybe to clock some other circuit that you're building, um, you can do so. You can map one of these generated clocks to a GPIO and put it out through one of the GPIO ports. Okay. So, and, and I can point you incidentally to a couple of, um, well, actually, let me come to that in a moment. I'm, I'm gonna point you in a moment to where you can find some examples for how to manipulate stuff like this. But let me first talk about the power saving subsystem here. So let's go back up to the table of contents. And I wanna go to power control. Okay, so you know there's there's uh, not as many visuals for this subsystem, but you have a few options for controlling the amount of power that you're drawing on the RP2040. Um, essentially, you you have options for reducing your dynamic power, which is to say the power that you're drawing when the system is running, and then you also have the opportunity to put the system into what they call a dormant state, where you're essentially everything is dead. And we'll talk about how to, how to do this. Um, but you turn off the entire RP2040 and you put it in a state where it will wake either on some GPIO event. So you can tell the system, hey, go absolutely dormant and only wake up when you see a rising edge on this particular GPIO port. Or alternatively, you can have it wake up based on a real-time clock interrupt. So essentially you turn off the whole system. The only subsystem that you keep alive is the real-time clock and you clock that subsystem from an external clock. So not, none, of the, none of the clock sources or clock generators on the RP2040 are turned on. The clock being off of something external. And that real time clock is measuring the passage of time. And when it measures a certain amount of time as having passed, it throws an interrupt that wakes up the whole system. So let's see, let's talk about this. So. Um, there are essentially two low power states that you can put the system into. One is called sleep and the other is called dormant. In the sleep state, what you can do is modify the values of a couple of registers. One is called sleep enable and the other is called wake enable. And if we look at each of these registers, what they do, what they allow for you to do is specify which of those clocks that we just looked at should be turned on, should be gated when the system is in its sleep state and when the system is in its wake state. So you could imagine that if you're going to put the system to sleep, you could configure this sleep register such that only a handful of the clocks, the ones that were required to actually keep the system alive and in a position to turn back on when you wanted it to come awake again, you could only keep those clocks awake, turn off all of the others, and then by modifying a, a, a register with, just, with essentially the same sort of uh, description here associated with the wake state, you could then specify a different subset. A, 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 you could specify which of the clocks that you want to have on when the system is awake. So the notion here is that you would have some subset of all the clocks on when the system is awake. You would minimize it to the greatest extent possible for your particular application to save power. And then when the system goes to sleep, you would turn off all of the clocks that aren't required to actually wake the system back up again. So in practice, probably, you would have more clocks on when you're awake than when you're asleep, but there would still be some on when you're asleep so that you can actually wake the system back up. Let's scroll back up here. Go back to the power section. Um, the one subsystem that that sleep and wake register does not touch 
is the actual processors, the ARM processors themselves. Um, remember that you know the RP2040 contains within it two ARM Cortex M0s that are developed by the company ARM, and those those processors have their own set of data sheets. So this sort of became apparent when we were talking about how interrupts are handled internally in the RP2040. And what we talked about when we were having that discussion is that when you're configuring an interrupt and setting up an interrupt service routine, there's sort of two steps involved. Um, the first step is to go talk to the peripheral that's going to be throwing the interrupts and say, hey, peripheral, please turn on your interrupts. And then the second step was going and talking to that nested vector interrupt controller, which is a part of the ARM Cortex M0, and telling that to please pay attention to this particular interrupt and when you see it, call this exception handler with this address that we've just specified, right? So there's the, the arm is sort of its own system within the RP2040. If we want to put the system into a sleep state, in addition to modifying the value of that sleep register, right? Which essentially allows for us to configure the peripherals in the RP2040. We also have to go talk to the arm and tell the arm that we want for it to go into a low power sleep mode. And we do so by um by calling one of a couple of instructions these are low level sort of uh, assembly instructions that the arm understands one is wfi wait for interrupt the other is wfe wait for event and what this says is please go into a low power mode until in the event of a wfi some interrupt occurs or alternatively please go into a low power mode until you see some event occur um, you know, some clock telling you that it's time to go or something like that, right? So in addition to putting all of the peripherals into a low power state, we also separately have to put the arm into a low power state. And we do so by means of these two low level, low level instructions. And then it wakes up when either processor is awoken by an interrupt. Questions about this? Right. So the sleep state allows for you to do things like the, what the data sheet is specifying here is it allows for you to do things like put the system into a, a low power mode and then have some peripheral wake it up. The example that they're using here is the UART peripheral. So the system would be asleep. And then when you receive some character over the UART channel, that UART interrupt wakes the system up and it carries on doing whatever it was going to do. But your average power consumption would be considerably lower than if you had the system just running full tilt the whole time. It allows for the system to essentially rest until something interesting happens, take care of whatever it needs to take care of when the interesting thing happens, and then go back into a resting mode. Which, by the way, maybe I should just, at a very, very high level, that's the way to really think about power saving on these systems is what you want. Suppose you're developing some sort of an IoT sensor system, which at least one group has been talking about something kind of like this. Um, what you want to do in those systems is to keep the system in as low a power mode as you can possibly manage for as much of its life as you can possibly manage. And then you wake it up, it's going to do, a, it's going to execute a series of instructions that are, are um, require a relatively large amount of power. Perhaps, for instance, it's gathering some measurements from a handful of sensors. Maybe it's consolidating those measurements into a packet and then communicating it out through a radio or an SPI channel or something, right? It's somehow getting information back to the person that actually cares about the information. So the exercise when developing an ultra low power system is first, get this, the power consumption in sleep mode as low as you can possibly manage. And this, this sleep mode is a step in the right direction. I'm going to talk about an even lower power mode here in a moment. But essentially, you want the system in as close to completely off as you can manage. And then whenever you want to take a measurement, you want the system to wake up and as quickly as it can, do whatever it needs to do, gather a batch of measurements, do a communication, and then go back to sleep. So you are trying to minimize the ratio of on time to, off, to sleep time, right? This is in contrast to, you, you could imagine that, uh, suppose you wanted to report a measurement, oh, I don't know, every five minutes. One way that you could do that is to put the system into a sleep or a dormant state 
configure the real-time clock so that it wakes the system up every five minutes. It does whatever it needs to do and then goes back to sleep. That is in contrast to the alternative, which would be some sort of a polling system where maybe you're sitting there in a busy while loop polling the timer peripheral to see when five minutes has expired and then executing whatever series of instructions you need to execute. That is going to consume considerably mo more power than the first option that I mentioned, which is sleeping it and then waking it. These sorts of power saving problems I, I find really sort of fun. Um, much like, you know, it gets rather addicting to try to shave cycles off of a process in like the Boyd's lab. It can get very addicting also to try to shave, you know, microamps off of your power consumption when you're trying to do something like this. By the way, it requires that you have some sort of instrumentation to actually measure the, the power that you're consuming. Um, I'm going to get some of that instrumentation for the lab. I think that would be some nice infrastructure to have for our lab. I would love, in, in a future year, I think we'll have a lab in this class that's sort of IoT flavored where the metric by which we evaluate student performance is average power consumption as measured by one of these devices so that we could, you know, get people to really dig into these different modes and try to turn off all the stuff that they're not using and then turn it back on. Okay, so that's sleep mode. In dormant mode, in dormant mode, it's a, as they describe it, a true zero dynamic power sleep state. So all the clocks and all the oscillators get disabled. So the system is, is all the stuff that can be turned off on the system is turned off. The ring oscillator is turned off. Um, all the PLLs are turned off. And then we configure the system to come back to life based on some event. That event, as I mentioned, could be some condition occurring on one of the GPIO ports, a rising edge coming from sort of some external device. Or alternatively, you could put the system into dormant mode, but keep the real-time clock peripheral alive and being fed by some sort of an external clock so that it can wake the system up from the dormant state. Um, something to be aware of when you're trying to get the system into a dormant mode is the, when you, when you put the system into dormant mode, it does not automatically affect the phase lock loops. You have to first go in and turn off all the PLLs. Then you can put the system into dormant mode. And when you put it into dormant mode, it will turn off all of the oscillators also, the ring oscillator and so on. So when you put it into dormant mode, you better have the conditions under which it wakes configured. But this is as low power as you can get it. Um, are there questions about this? By the way, I'm going to talk about the real time clock here in just a moment. But the, that external clock that supplies the real time clock, uh, the real time clock peripheral, that external clock can have a frequency as low as one hertz. And in fact, as we see in a moment, this real time clock peripheral, it, it requires a, a clock input to actually measure the passage of time. That clock input to the real time clock should be one hertz. If you're not clocking it off of some external clock that has, a, that has that frequency, what we do with the real time clock is divide down the frequency of whatever clock we're using to feed it such that we get one hertz after that divider. So it measures the passage of seconds. Owen? How long does it take to come out of one of these states? That's a good question. It is, it is specified in here. I can't remember offhand, but it is, uh, it is on the order, I believe, of... Actually, I'm going to withhold an answer. The, the answer is in here. I'll look it up, and then I can report it back to you, or you, or you can look it up yourself. But you are correct that it takes um, a non-zero amount of time, and you have to wait for the system to sort of come back alive before you can start going again. The other thing you have to do if you come back from a dormant state, when you come back, it will turn the ring oscillator back on. Incidentally, that ring oscillator, when you boot the system up, it's that ring oscillator that's the first thing to turn on, and it is used for the boot up sequence. So then the ring oscillator is used to then start up all the other systems, some of which might be the phase lock loops, and then the system will transition over to being clocked off the phase lock loops. When you come back to dormant, you have to go back in and reconfigure and turn back on the PLLs as well. Will not happen automatically. <laughs> 
Anybody trying to get low power in their uh, final projects? Yeah. I mean, kind of. We're using batteries, but like, not. Okay. I guess we can replace the battery. Yeah, yeah, you can replace the batteries. That's true. Um, for a project I was working on a while ago, it was like a, an IoT flavored system for use in um, vineyards, actually. The notion was we'll put sensors in the grape leaves. They measure temperature, humidity, and then report that back to the vineyard manager. Turns out that information can actually be actionable to the vineyard managers because it affects, oh, we'll go apply some fungicide here and a little less over here, that kind of thing. Um, but, but we cared very, very deeply about this sort of power management thing to try to increase the battery life of these. And um, yeah, you start to discover power dissipation in places that you don't expect. Like for instance, one of the sensors that I was using was an I2C sensor, which as you all are now deeply aware, requires these pull-up resistors. And um, what I was discovering is I had a, a very low current ammeter set up so I could measure the current being drawn from the system. I would turn off the I2C channels, turn off the associated sensor, but I would continue to see excess current being drawn until I actually unplugged the sensor from the RP2040. The reason for this was a little bit of current was being pulled through the pull-up resistors and then down through the, the I don't know what the internal circuitry was in this sensor, but it was allowing for a little bit of current to leak through the I2C connections down through the ground. The solution in that case ended up being putting a low side transistor between the sensor and ground. So that to turn off the sensor, instead of effectively pulling power for the sensor down to ground, what would happen instead is we would disengage this, or we would you know, open this transistor, which was acting as a switch, which would effectively pull ground for the sensor up to power. And that eliminated the power dissipation through those resistors, right? So when you start sniffing around looking for current leaks, you find them in some places that you might not expect. It's a fun exercise to go through. That was with a CC1310 microcontroller, which Texas Instruments designed to be as exceptionally low power. And uh, while keeping a GPS in standby mode, I could, the, the lowest power mode that I could achieve with that was, I think, 90 microwatts. Really, really low power. Okay, let's take a look at the real time clock. This is, by the way, uh, so this, I, I apologize, this is sort of an all over the place lecture, but it's because we're getting to the systems which are deeply coupled with other systems. We sort of have to talk about all these things. Um, but let me just remind you, the real time clock, it is one of these peripherals that is included in this you know, list of peripherals that's available on here. So, you know, we configure and control it in a similar sense that we configure and control the timer or the PWM channels or the SPI channels or any of the other things that we've looked at this semester. Um, so the real time clock is, is indicated there. Uh, it is not green because it doesn't touch the GPIOs. This is a fully internal peripheral. But we can scroll down and take a look at this. So, real time clock. Real time clock. So, what the real time clock allows for you to do is you, um, you specify the reference that will feed this particular peripheral, this is the clock that it will use to measure the passage of time. It can be an external reference. It could be an external reference coming from, you know, some other clock generating circuit or device. You set the clock, which is to say when the system turns on, you have to go through a step where you tell it, it is October 31st, 2022 at this hour, this minute, this many seconds. You initialize the time. The real time clock will then use that reference clock to just measure the passage of time in sort of human units. You can go into this peripheral and read the time and it will report back the time to you in years, months, days, minutes, hours, you know, the units that people use to sort of measure the passage of time. So it'll measure time passing, you know, in human readable units. And then the other thing that you can do is configure an alarm where you say, here's the time that it is now. When you measure this year, this month, you know, this minute, please throw an alarm 
And you can attach and interrupt that alarm so that some code runs when that alarm gets thrown. So if you're trying to do things like set or can make like an alarm clock, this is a really nice peripheral to know about. Remember that the timer peripheral that we sort of started this class talking about, it's a 64-bit timer. Um, those alarm registers, however, that we use to do something similar, right? Remember the alarm registers, we could specify a value in those alarm registers. And when the value that we specified matched the value of the lowest 32 bits of that 64-bit microsecond timer, an interrupt could get thrown where we could do something. Um, if you figure, if you do the math there and you say, okay, I have 32 bits to spend and we're incrementing that value at one microsecond, what you find is that that overflows about every 72 minutes. So if you want to schedule code for execution at times farther out than about 72 minutes, this real-time clock is really handy to know about. You could schedule execution for, uh, of code for 10 years from now. <laughs> if you really wanted to, using it, as long as you kept the thing powered and kept the thing running, and it would execute, you know, 10 years from now, if you cared to have it do that. Um, and as I mentioned, this expects a one hertz reference signal. You can supply it with some much faster signal, and what you then do, or what will be done for you when you call the CSDK functions associated with this, is it will divide down that reference clock to one hertz. Questions about this? So in terms of you know, level of complexity, this is a pretty, pretty simple peripheral to work with. Yeah? Can this be used in any way for like random numbers, or is that totally separate? You could use the ring oscillator for random number generation. And uh, in fact, Bruce has been experimenting with this considerably. So um, here's some, some demo code put together that you could take a look at. But because the frequency of the real-time oscillator is a function of things that are just a part of the ambient world. There's a sense of real randomness in the, the frequency of the ring oscillator that we can take advantage of. And there, there are strategies for if you, you know, measure the randomness, there, there are mechanisms by which you can sort of quantify how random a system is. Right? So you could do that with the ring oscillator and you'd find that it is, you know, a certain amount of random. And then there are strategies for improving that generating increasingly pure random numbers out of this thing. Okay, so if you want to find examples of these things, there are a couple of, of directories that I want to point you to, in part because these are just interesting as well. One is uh, a directory called Pico Extras. This is Kind of interesting. The RP2040 is new, right? This only came out in January of 2021. There's a lot of development still being done on it. The SDK is still being developed. And in fact, if you, you may have noticed this in your own code, depending on what you've been working on, um, the documentation is updated all the time still because it's so new. This repository here, Pico Extras, contains a bunch of stuff that may ultimately end up in the SDK, but isn't there yet. So it's stuff that's sort of under development or under test. And if you go into each of these directories, you'll find that some are sort of further along than others. But it's kind of interesting to see this work in progress. But one of the, uh, there are a couple of directories here that are of relevance to the stuff that we've been talking about. One is Pico Sleep, which is not included in the SDK yet, but much like you cloned in the SDK for use in your own projects, you can clone in Pico Extras and use this stuff with the understanding that it's still sort of in development, still being tested. But there are examples of how to use some of the peripherals that we've been talking about. Pico Sleep uh, includes an API for putting the system into that sleep mode that we talked about and the dormant mode that we talked about. So it is a, a C library that will ultimately probably be included in the CSDK, but isn't quite finished yet. But even so, if you're trying to look for, you know, some help for configuring these peripherals, this is a good resource. Um, and the other one I wanted to point out was the hardware ring oscillator API, which, it, you know, as the name suggests, it includes some CSDK functions that may ultimately become included in the, the SDK 
that manipulate and configure and control the ring oscillator. You might find that interesting as well. And if you want to see examples of the, um, the libraries that are in that directory being used, there's another directory called Pico Playground, which is set up very much like that Pico examples directory, which most of you have downloaded. So the Pico examples, I'll just remind you. What that is, is a directory of example projects that show you how to use the CSDK. So the notion is that on your own computer or on one of the lab computers, you will have downloaded the CSDK. You can download this examples directory. And what the example directory provides is a whole bunch of sort of toy examples that show you how you might use that SDK library that you have at your disposal. This playground directory is similar to the Pico examples directory, but it includes examples of those sort of experimental still in development things that live in the Pico extras directory. So for instance, if we scroll down here, there is an example of hello dormant and hello sleep, which provide just a little example of how you could put the system into a dormant mode using that sleep library that we were just looking at in the other repository, right? So just something interesting to kind of point you to. The other interesting thing to note about this Pico playground example is uh, many of these examples run at 48 megahertz instead of 125 megahertz. How do you think that is? Not quite. So suppose you were developing a microcontroller. How would you test your microcontroller design? An old microcontroller? <laughs> Maybe, or, or on an FPGA, right? So when they were developing the RP2040, when Raspberry Pi was developing the RP2040, they were testing the design of it before they actually cut silicon on an FPGA. And they were running that that prototyped RP2040 implemented on the FPGA at 48 megahertz. So a lot of these examples are quite old. They're from the time when this was being developed. And so for that reason, they would run on my, I believe that these originally were running on the FPGA implementation of the RP2040 and that system was running at 48 megahertz. It's also, by the way, I believe why the ADC clock is 48 megahertz. It was all prototyped at 48 megahertz on the FPGA. Okay. Any questions about this stuff? So let's see here. What haven't we talked about? We talked about these processors, right? We've talked about how interrupts work associated with these two processors. We've talked about this SIO. Remember, this is from way back. This SIO contains all the peripherals to which the processors require low latency access. There's a FIFO in here that allows for interprocessor communication. All those spin locks live in this SIO. Right? So we've talked quite a bit about that. We talked about most of the other stuff that connects to this bus. Uh, in terms of peripherals, we've talked at length about the SPI channels. We talked about the PWM. You use that to drive the motors. Uh, we've talked about UART. You're using this to communicate back to PuTTY. We talked about the timer peripheral. We, we waved our hands and talked a little bit about the real-time clock. Right, That's something that you might find useful. We talked about the I2C peripheral. We use this to communicate with the IMU in lab three. We talked about the ADC. Um, remember that the ADC, there's a MUX on the ADC, a five input MUX. Four of those map to GPIO inputs. The fifth one maps to an internal temperature sensor. So if you were to choose MUX input number five to the ADC, what you would be measuring is the value of that internal temperature sensor. We didn't actually do that in lab, but using your code from lab one, you could modify that code such that instead of reading 
the analog voltage on a GPIO pin attached to a microphone, you were instead sampling the internal temperature sensor. Um, we have not yet talked about the watchdog timer. We could do so. Folks, do folks have a sense of what this watchdog timer is or does? Okay, so what the watchdog does is it is a, a timer. So you specify a certain amount of time, much like the, the timer peripheral, right? There's a, a register in here where you specify a certain amount of time into the future, and it will measure the passage of time and see when the amount of time that has passed matches the amount that you've specified. It does so, I believe, I, I can double check the documentation, but I believe it's watching this timer peripherals internal um, incrementing microsecond timer. In the event that there is a match, what the watchdog will do is you can, you can configure what it does, but often what it does is do a software reset of the whole system. So the way that this is often used is suppose you have some application or some program that has you know, a complicated, a complicated sequence of events. Maybe you're measuring information from a whole variety of sensors. And partway through that process, what you would go, what you would do is go in and reset the watchdog timer value so that it doesn't actually expire. You, you reset it out to the future so that that reset never actually occurs. But in the event that for some reason your program hangs, maybe you go try to communicate with a sensor and the whole system hangs. What the watchdog allows for is autonomous reset of the system to try to get it out of a hung state. So in some sort of a field deployed application where, you know, if the system hangs, it's not easy or practical to go out and actually reset it. This is a really nice peripheral to know about because it allows for you to essentially put in an automatic reboot capability. Um, maybe next time we'll just take a peek at some of the registers associated with this in, in the event that people want to hear about it. And then there's a series of the, the power on state machine we didn't talk about, reset control we didn't really talk about. We can talk about these things to the extent that people are interested. Um, let's see. We talked about each of these two PIO peripherals. Remember these we're writing the assembler code for. We talked pretty extensively about these DMA channels. So we've covered quite a bit of ground here. What haven't we talked about? I have not talked about this USB interface. As some of you may have discovered by reading through the data sheet, you can set up the RP2040 as a USB device. So it can, for instance, you could write a program where you plug it into the PC and the PC thinks it's a mouse or thinks it's a keyboard or something like that. Um, I have to do more research on this particular peripheral, which is why I haven't discussed it yet. But depending on what some of you are doing for your final projects, you, you may be interested in researching and implementing something associated with this peripheral. If you document it really well, your documentation will become a part of this course documentation. Okay. So I think next time we'll talk about the watchdog and maybe fill in a couple of these remaining gaps. I think I want to talk a little bit about electrodes as well. So I think we'll discuss that. Um, and then we'll take it from there. Is there anything that I haven't talked about that folks would like to hear about? Yeah. It's a quick question. How much uh, memory do you think uh, could be supported with like an SPI, an external SPI uh, memory? So um, if you want external memory, How much memory could be supported? I mean, I mean, megabytes, gigabytes. We have in lab some external uh, non-volatile memory that looks like an SPI device that can store a megabit. Those are really easy to interface with. It is also the case that the interface to <coughs> SD cards is usually there is an SPI interface to them. There's also this special SD card interface, but you can often communicate them via an, with them via an SPI channel. Setting up and configuring those is non-trivial, but you know that gives you a ton of external memory if you care. Yeah. Um, there is an SD card library, and I got it working. So if you want to do SD cards, awesome. That would be great. SD card. 
Anything else? Yeah. Can we go over kind of light, like LEG interfacing stuff? Because I know I've been looking around and some of them require like pretty specific things to control, like matrix sure. stuff. Um, like those LED light strips? There's like light strips and there's also like matrix scenes. Okay. Um, okay. And I've been looking around and some of them like are kind of Arduino only and not Raspberry Pi or whatever. Um, we could talk about some of those interfaces. Um, the interface incidentally to some of those light strips, they, they have kind of an unusual interface that looks like essentially PWM waves that you send into it. That, as it turns out, is a really nice implement, or a really nice thing to implement using the PIO system. And in fact, there's some examples in the Pico examples folder that implement an interface to a, a LED strip via the PIO. Might be nice to know about. Okay, please submit your purchase request by the end of the day. And um, we'll get started on final projects this week.